Hello, and welcome to day three of the Institute of Policy Studies, Singapore Perspectives 2021. I'm Ong So Chin, IPS Deputy Director for Strategic Planning and External Relations. This year's Singapore Perspectives is unique as it has four sessions, three online and one hybrid plenary session, which will close the event on Monday. I'm sure many of you have enjoyed the energetic debates that came out of the first two online installments last week. Today is the last online session, and it promises to be an exciting one as well, with three forums, all centered on the theme, politics and governance to build a democratic society. This morning's discussion, the first of the day, is on multilateralism and global cooperation, an important topic seeing as the world is in the midst of an extremely polarized era, which has brought to the fore the worst of nativist and tribal instincts. Yet, while the effects of the pandemic have fed protectionist sentiments in nations, they've also created opportunities for collaboration. I'd like to encourage everyone to ask questions via pigeonhole in the question submission section on this forum's page. But to please keep your comments civil, respectful, and focus on the topic at hand. Moderating this morning's discussion is Associate Professor Eugene Tan from the School of Law of the Singapore Management University. Eugene specializes in constitutional and administrative law. He's also a frequent political commentator and a former nominated member of parliament. I'd like to welcome you, Eugene, and hand the panel over to you. Thank you very much, uh, So Chin. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, Forum um, 7, uh, where we will look at the issue of uh, multilateralism uh, and global cooperation. I think it goes without saying that uh, both multilateralism and global cooperation are in retreat. Um, the lack of a, a clear uh, global leader um, you know, has, of course, made things uh, rather difficult in terms of trying to deal with the common challenges that face uh, mankind. So whether we're looking at the global pandemic uh, or whether we are, we, we are talking about climate change, uh, international trade, um, all these are very much dependent you know, on a thriving uh, and workable, uh, you know, multilateral uh, system. I think it's important to, you know, to understand why Singapore has um, succeeded uh, because of the multilateral system. You know, that ensures, you know, that small states uh, like Singapore, you know, would be able to plan, uh, you know, with certainty uh, and also be able to ensure uh, you know, that there is uh, international uh, rule of law. But I think what is crucial about multilateralism is certainly the expectations of uh, reciprocity among uh, the different uh, members of, of, a, of a multilateral uh, system. And of course, you know, we, we mustn't forget multilateralism operates within uh, you know, the very important principle of, of, of state sovereignty. Right? So the idea that territorial states, you know, have uh, possession of territory and, and are able to exclude others from it. But it also means that multilateralism requires, you know, that openness of heart and minds and, and also the recognition, you know, that ultimately uh, the benefits that members obtain, uh, you know, in aggregate over time, you know, would, would far exceed, you know, them, uh, you know, acting in a unilateral basis or on, on, a, on a bilateral basis. And when we think about uh, uh, global cooperation, I think you know, that has been important when, when we look at how joint problems can be solved, uh, knowledge can be shared as well as best practices. Um, and if we look at you know, the, the 2008 financial crisis, I think you know, when we look at the coordination, you know, that was not something that stemmed from uh, the selflessness of, of the different um, political actors, the nation states, but it was also precisely because you know, mem uh, the individual actors recognized that it was in their interest to work together. Right? So in other words, you know, enlightened uh, self-interest. Um, so I think you know, at a time when, when we have to uh, deal with the many challenges, uh, I think what is of great concern is that uh, global misalignment right, with regard to how cooperation is being uh, carried out, or perhaps one would say, you know, that there is inadequate 
uh, cooperation. So if you think about the multilateral institutions in the world today, whether it's the United Nations, uh, the WHO, the WTO, um, you know, I think it raises questions of whether they are thriving beacons of multilateralism or whether they are multilateral institutions um, only uh, in name. Um, and one final point is, of course, you know, whether uh, multilat the multilateral system, you know, instead of advancing, drawing prosperity, uh, never mind that it is a system that is imperfect, has perhaps in recent years, you know, been used as a mechanism by rich um, one state actor, uh, you know, could punish, um, you know, another uh, um, state actor. So to, to look at the issue of multilateralism and global cooperation from various angles, you know, I'm very privileged to be able to moderate uh, this morning's panel. Uh, let me just briefly uh, introduce the speakers uh, and discussants. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, I will not go into the extensive series. You will uh, have access to the conference kit. Uh, and, I, and I encourage uh, you to look at um, you know, their, their, their bios there, which in many ways, you know, is only just a, a, a synopsis of uh, a very succinct statement of, of what they do. Um, the panel will kick off with uh, Professor uh, Jared uh, Diamond, uh, who, who comes to us all the way from uh, Los Angeles in the USA. Um, professor Diamond is the Professor of Geography at, at, at UCLA. Um, and, and of course, you know, we, many of us know Professor Diamond uh, you know, for his best-selling uh, books. Uh, you know, whether uh, here we are looking at titles such as Guns, Germs, uh, and Steel, uh, Collapse, How Societies Choose, or Fall, uh, Choose to Fail or, or Succeed, uh, and The World Until Yesterday. Um, next, we have, uh, you know, Professor uh, Joseph Liao. Um, Professor Liao is the Tan Kah Kee Chair in Comparative Politics and, uh, and International Politics at the at the Nanyang Technological University. Um, he's also the Dean of the College of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences um, at, at the NTU. Uh, we have uh, two discussants. Uh, they are Professor Dale Fisher. Um, many of you would be very familiar with Professor Fisher. Uh, you know, he was actively uh, giving his insights uh, you know, during the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, which is of course ongoing. Uh, Professor Fisher is the senior consultant at the Division of Infectious Diseases at the Department of Medicine at the National University Hospital. Uh, and last but not least, um, you know, we have uh, Ms. Tan Yuan, the Dean of the Diplomatic Academy at Singapore's uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, and so we have on this panel, you know, not just uh, academics, right? I think you, you will notice from their work that there is a very strong empirical bent, uh, you know, in the work of uh, Professor Diamond as well as Professor Liao, um, and certainly of uh, Professor Fisher as well. Uh, and, and Ms. Tan, you know, uh, being a diplomat and, and, and having served at various diplomatic postings, including those at, at the multilateral institutions, uh, you know, can give us, you know, th these important insights, um, uh, you know, into uh, the state of uh, multilateralism and glo global cooperation, you know, and how you know, as the world resets and, and as Singapore resets, you know, how uh, we can seek to ensure that multilateralism and global cooperation, you know, will continue to provide, you know, that, that vital uh, infrastructure for Singapore. Um, so let me now uh, turn uh, the floor uh, to Professor Jared Diamond. Uh, Professor Diamond? It's a great pleasure for me to be with you this evening for me, because sunset was about one hour ago, I'm in Los Angeles in the study of my wife, one and a half miles from my university, University of California at Los Angeles, with you virtually, good morning to you. My first visit to Singapore was 42 years ago. I've been back to your country many times since then with a great deal of pleasure. It's a pleasure for me to be with you now, and my regret is only that I'm with you virtually rather than in person. My next in-person visit will have to wait for the future. In the course of the next 15 minutes, um, I would like to explore with you a large topic, the subject of multilateralism and global cooperation in this era of 
COVID. What is COVID? Why is it such a big deal? In a way, COVID is familiar. In a way, COVID is new. COVID is familiar because <laughs> there have been big diseases in the past that have killed lots of people. Most famously, perhaps the Black Death of the Middle Ages, the cholera epidemics of the last couple of centuries, the AIDS epidemic of the last 50 years. So COVID is another disease that's familiar. It's a mild disease. Only about 2% of people infected with COVID die of it, whereas Black Death killed 30% of its victims and AIDS kills 100% of its victims. So why then is COVID such a big deal, this apparently familiar mild disease? Um, it's a big deal because it is worldwide, it spread worldwide quickly. Why? Partly because of jet planes. There were no jet planes at the time of the Black Death and few jet planes at the time of the AIDS epidemic outbreak. And also COVID is a very transmissible disease much more transmissible than is AIDS, with the result that it is spread around the world in a short time and become a subject of terror more than the plagues of the past. COVID has lessons, many lessons to teach us. One direct lesson is that COVID is a disease that emerged from dis diseases of animals to infect humans. In fact, all of the diseases that have emerged in, in recent times have come to us from animals. AIDS, SARS, COVID also came to us from animals, from contact between humans and animals, apparently in animal markets. Animal markets are still open. Humans are still in contact with, with animals. The markets are most intense in Africa and in Asia. The, the Asian markets already gave us SARS, now they've given us COVID, but contact between humans and animals is still active. So we have to expect that COVID is not the last emerging diseases. There are going to be more emerging diseases as long as there is contact between humans and wild animals. That's one direct lesson. Another lesson, a broader one, um, involves COVID and cooperation. COVID is a global risk. It affects every country in the world. To overcome COVID will require cooperation, global cooperation between every country in the world. There have been global risks before. Climate change, of course, was and is a global risk. Resource depletion was and is a global risk. In the case of COVID, no country is going to be safe against COVID until the whole world is safe against COVID. There is no way that Singapore could eliminate the risk of COVID for itself because Singapore will just get reinfected by its neighbors. The United States, although it's much larger than COVID, the United States, again, cannot achieve security against COVID until the whole world is safe. So COVID teaches us the importance of global cooperation it is a global risk that demands global cooperation and nobody will be safe until everybody is safe. That's one lesson of COVID. Another lesson of COVID is the lesson, be prepared. This was a risk that we should have anticipated. There have been emerging diseases before. The mechanism by which SARS came to us is the same mechanism, animal human contact, by which COVID came to us and yet we were not prepared for COVID. We should have been prepared for COVID. A country that is prepared for everything and that can serve as a model for us is the Scandinavian country of Finland. Finland, that small Scandinavian country in Northern Europe that borders on Russia and on Sweden. The Finns make a practice of being prepared for everything. Why? Because the Finns had a bad experience in World War II when they were attacked by the Soviet Union their connections to the outside world were cut off. And ever since then, the Finns have thought of everything that can go wrong and they prepare for it. A Finnish friend of mine is on a Finnish government commission that meets every month. And each month they think of anything that could go wrong. Each month it's a different thing. One month they think of breakdown of the electricity net. 
Another month they think of failure of the financial system. Another month they think of end of food imports. Naturally, because the Finns plan for everything, they also planned for a epidemic. They did not know specifically about COVID, but several years ago, this Finnish monthly commission considered the possibility of the spread of a disease to Finland. And so Finland laid in a supply of face masks. The United States did not lay in face masks. Finland laid in face masks, but Finland also laid in a supply of fuel and of food and chemical. The Finns are prepared for everything. In that respect, Singapore and the United States and every other country in the world should imitate the example of Finland and consider everything that can go wrong and plan for it. A even bigger lesson of COVID is the, the need for cooperation. To overcome COVID, we will require cooperation among the countries of the world, but COVID is not the only issue. It's not even the most serious issue that requires global cooperation. Think of the bigger issues that are much more serious issues than COVID. The worst that COVID could do is to kill 2% of the world's population, 150 million people. That would be a huge tragedy, but there are threats to the world that threaten everybody in the world, not just 150 million people. Those big global threats are of course, climate change that endangers all of us, resource depletion, the exhaustion of the world's forests and fisheries and topsoil and even fresh water supply that endangers all of us, and inequality around the world, the disparities between poor countries and rich countries that make people in poor countries angry and jealous and prepared to vent their anger on rich countries. Nevertheless, even though climate change and resource depletion and inequality are much bigger threat than is COVID, these other big threats have not successfully mustered a demand for global cooperation. Why? And why has COVID instead caught our attention more? It's simple. COVID kills you quickly. If you're infected with COVID, you'll be dead within a couple of days. Why? Also, if you are infected of COVID and you die of COVID, there's no doubt that you died of COVID. Whereas climate change kills more slowly. It takes years for climate change to kill. And climate change, when someone dies of climate change, you don't say that person died of climate change. Instead, that person died of a tsunami or famine or disease spread that was a consequence of climate change. So COVID has caught our attention in the way that these more serious risks of climate change and resource depletion and inequality have not. My hope then is that COVID will galvanize the attention of the world to take seriously these big threats to the world. What's the role of Singapore in fostering global cooperation and multilateralism and helping the world solve these problems that affect Singapore, but every other country? Singapore, as I discovered on my first visit, and as all of you know very well, Singapore is a country that perhaps more than any other country in the world thrives on cooperation. Singapore thrives on trade more than any other country. Singapore is a small country with a small population. And yet you are crammed between big, populous, powerful neighbors. Singapore gets its climate from its neighbors from forest fires in neighboring countries. Singapore gets much of its water, its food, and its infectious diseases from its neighbors. neighbors. And so um, Singapore, is, Singapore exists through global cooperation, but Singapore for its well-being depends upon global cooperation. A, another way in which Singapore is key to multilateralism um, is that Singapore has a potential leadership role in Southeast Asia, a leadership role with respect to its neighbors, Malaysia, Indonesia, other neighbors. Why? Because Singapore's public health program is outstanding, perhaps the out, most outstanding public health program in Southeast Asia, one of the most outstanding in the world. Singapore leads its area in science. Singapore leads its area in government efficiency. And so Singapore can serve as a model to 
its neighbors for solving problems, including the COVID problem. What about the role of international organizations, uh, the role of multilateralism in solving not just the problem of COVID, but also these problems of climate change and resource depletion? COVID, like these other global problems, requires a global effort. There is no way that Singapore could solve the problem of COVID within Singapore by itself, even if Singapore succeeded in temporarily eliminating COVID within your borders, it would only be a matter of time, days maybe, before you got reinfected by people from other countries. Similarly, the United States. COVID didn't begin in the United States. COVID came to us from other countries. And there's no way that the United States could purge itself of COVID. Even if we succeeded in eliminating every case of COVID in the United States, we would just re get reinfected from other countries. So COVID teaches Singapore and teaches the United States and teaches every country in the world that to overcome the COVID problem will require a global effort. It will require cooperation, but Singapore thrives by cooperation. Are there models for successfully overcoming global problems, including global diseases by global efforts? Yes, the World Health Organization eliminated smallpox, the most feared disease of history, about 40 or 50 years ago. Regional cooperation eliminated rinderpest, the most dreaded disease of livestock. And now the World Health Organization is in the process of eliminating polio. So there are models from which we can take hope. There are successful models of world organizations eliminating threats to the world. What's my hope then? Um, COVID is a tragedy, but it's a tragedy that brings hope. It may be that the millions of deaths from COVID that the world has suffered so far will inspire the world, recognizing that COVID is a global problem requiring global cooperation. Perhaps global will finally inspire the world to take action against the big, the really big global problems, the problems of climate change, resource depletion, and of inequality. And if so, the tragedy of COVID may have produced in the long run a happy outcome by galvanizing us, encouraging people all around the world to take COVID as a model and to tackle the world's serious problems. Thank you for inviting me at least virtually to be with you in Singapore this evening for me, this morning for you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Diamond, you know, for the very broad uh, uh, view of how uh, diseases like COVID, you know, while it is not new, um, is something that, that gives rise to a tremendous uh, amount of concern. I thought you painted uh, the lessons you know that uh, humankind can take away uh, from COVID-19 uh, and so the, 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 the notion you know that um, COVID-19 could be a teacher if I could put it that way um, you know is something that is worth bearing in mind and of course it raises the question of whether will we learn the right lessons and, and will we learn those lessons well. Um, you ended on, on, on an optimistic note um, you know, that perhaps, you know, this, uh, in Singapore, we call this a crisis of a generation, um, you know, being a young nation, you know, that perhaps, you know, this will be something that will, that will inspire us, uh, you know, to, to see the role that multilateral institutions and global cooperation, and how perhaps even a small nation state, uh, you know, can be, uh, can provide, uh, you know, good examples, you know, for other countries, and, and much is in the same way that we, we will have to learn uh, you know, from the good practices and ideas of, of other societies. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Professor Liao, uh, I, may I now turn the, the floor to you? Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. Uh, very good morning to everyone. And indeed, uh, it is uh, an honour and in fact a daunting task to come after uh, Professor Diamond. Yeah, but I will, I will try my best. Um, for my 15 minutes, I'm going to take a step back from uh, this discussion about COVID. It's a very important discussion, but uh, and of course, we can circle back to it. But I want to look at the broader uh, issues uh, encompassed in the, in the title, yeah? multilateralism and global cooperation, and share some thoughts 
about the, the prospects as well as the challenges that uh, multilateralism uh, faces today. Now, let me start by um, sharing one uh, data point to, to illustrate how important multilateralism has become. Now, at the beginning of the 20th century, there were approximately about 37 intergovernmental organizations in existence. By the end of the 20th century, uh, 1st January uh, uh, 2001, um, this number had ballooned to more than uh, 7,000. Yeah? Uh, and this was about uh, 20, 21 years ago. Today, you can imagine that uh, the figure is probably uh, even larger. Yeah, so that sort of uh, sets the context of how important multilateralism is uh, for us. Now, since the end of the Second Cold War, uh, I think it's fair to say multilateralism has played an important role as a, both a feature as well as a pillar of the post-war international order, uh, especially in terms of fostering much-needed global cooperation. And I think uh, three points need to be made in this regard. First is that uh, multilateralism has, um, since the, the end of the war, enhanced security cooperation. Now, no doubt the period of the Cold War witnessed uh, you know, a spread of small satellite conflicts as well as proliferation of nuclear weapons. So it's not, it's not a case that there was no conflict. Yeah? Uh, a lot of these conflicts, as we know, were, were small wars of uh, national liberation, even if there was this overlay of superpower rivalry that was evident. The UN, um, its record was far from perfect, but it did play a, a role in managing some of these conflicts, and we should uh, recognize that. Similarly, while the world witnessed during this period the proliferation of nuclear weapons during the Cold War, it also saw the emergence of various multilateral efforts to, to curb the growth uh, while encouraging a nuclear disarmament. Right? Foremost is the, the MPT, the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, which entered into force uh, I think it was 1970. Second, multilateralism has facilitated the expansion and deepening of economic cooperation and governance. Yeah? Again, not without flaws and shortcomings, uh, and there were many, but the, the Bretton Woods system and the institutions it birthed, such as the IMF and the World Bank, uh, as well as uh, GATT, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, and its successor, the WTO, have provided uh, what we call the, the, the fundamentals of the liberal international order, yeah? the a rules-based foundation for financial, commercial, trade relations among states uh, since the Second World War. Third, multilateralism has, in a sense, also facilitated the growth of transnationalism in terms of how regional and local governments, as well as other domestic institutions, have been awakened to the possibilities of trans-border cooperation at, at their levels, at more uh, municipal, local levels. There are actually many examples of this. Yeah? Uh, as globalization gathered pace and communications have improved through infrastructure, through technology, we have witnessed the, the mushrooming of initiatives that have brought together regional and provincial governments. I suppose it, you could say it began with the creation of uh, this concept of sister cities, uh, friendly cities, which were essentially efforts between provinces and cities to foster deeper cultural and commercial cooperation. This practice of city diplomacy has since expanded into multilateral efforts. So one good example is the ASEAN Smart Cities Network. Another example uh, of this phenomenon is the enhanced cooperation and coordination we have seen taking place between institutions such as central banks. So you look at, the, for example, the, the G10 Central Bankers Group that meets on the sidelines of uh, IMF and uh, World Bank meetings to coordinate uh, policies. So in terms of the value of multilateralism to global cooperation, it is important to draw attention, I think, to three elemental principles that underpin these efforts. The first of these principles is inclusivity. Now, by inclusivity, I don't mean to say that every multilateral organization should be open to every state. Yeah, that's not the, that's not the idea. But as a principle, a multilateral organization should be open to states that have a direct and immediate interest, I think, uh, in, the, in the issues that the organization is designed to address. And that would be affected by these issues. 
the point really is that the world is growing uh, closer together and increasingly interdependent. What this means is that challenges are increasingly global and transborder in nature. Yeah? So by that logic, states will invariably have to cooperate in order to head off the risks and dangers, something that uh, uh, Professor Diamond had alluded to already in the context of COVID. Now, this leads to um, what I see as the second principle, the importance of an order that is rules-based. Now, while power remains the currency, if not the key instrument of foreign policy, uh, especially for larger states, yeah, let's not uh, kid ourselves about this. Let's not be naive about this. Yet, in order for stability to prevail, it cannot be the only tool or even the preferred tool. To that end, I think the sharpening uh, of the edges of raw power can be mitigated in two ways. Uh, the in the first instance, in the first way is what we, what we call the uh, balance of power, you know, which basically refers in an abstract sense to an equilibrium that is established between uh, great powers on which uh, peace and stability rest. Now, accompanying the balance of power is the creation of a rules-based order. This refers to the creation of uh, rules of the road, so to speak, that are laid out to underpin and govern relations between states and more importantly, the commitment of states to abide by these rules. And a lot of these rules are encapsulated and expressed and represented in the multilateral institutions that we have today. Finally, it is important to also register that the basis of multilateralism is, of course, global cooperation and not conflict. Indeed, it is precisely the risk that the application of raw power um, uh, poses a threat to peace and stability, uh, and you only have to look at the, the two world wars of the, the last uh, century. Um, it is because of this risk that highlights the urgent need for multilateral efforts at cooperation. But let me now turn to some of the, the dislocations that disrupt and complicate efforts to foster greater multilateral cooperation. Now indeed, if you fast forward to today, it is evident that we are in the midst of major global transitions and transformations that are bringing about societal change and political dislocations. Huh? Um, we are at the beginning of this era, and it is unclear how long it will last and what further changes it may portend. Um, what we do know at this point is that these transformations have generated forces that present some, uh, some complex challenges for multilateralism. And broadly speaking, let me outline three of the transformations taking place and the challenges they pose. First, and uh, perhaps the most frequently discussed, is the transformational shift in global power, yeah, illustrated most profoundly by the relative decline of the US and the rise of China. Um, the US has uh, long been uh, accepted as a dominant power in global affairs. That power has been eroded by a number of uh, developments, the financial crisis of 2008, the, the burdensome costs of wars of, in Afghanistan and Iraq. And then, of course, you had the Trump administration and all its uh, policies, many of which I think uh, did actually undermine um, American uh, the, the leadership role of the US. And all this was occurring at the same time when China was growing increasingly uh, confident and assertive in its neighborhood and beyond. Uh, the BRI, of course, uh, which bears the imprimatur of, the, of President Xi Jinping, uh, was an effort to project China as a responsible global power capable of providing uh, global public goods to the international community. And um, you, can, you can say that as well about um, China's position on, uh, on uh, COVID and its policies uh, with regards to COVID uh, as well. Um, we can, of course, uh, discuss this uh, uh, later. Um, so uh, essentially, it signal, you know, the rise of China signals a challenge to the US and to a lesser extent, the European dominated global order that we have grown familiar with. Second, we are witnessing the transformation of modes of production caused by the technological revolution. The technologies that define uh, what we call the fourth industrial revolution are quickly permeating all aspects of daily life. Um, and its consequences, I think, have yet to be uh, fully known or appreciated. 
some of the con some of the concerns uh, that arise from this are number one, uh, job displacement because of automation and uh, digitization, um, and the kind of uh, inequalities that uh, this might exacerbate. Number two, the consequences of free unregulated use of technology that uh, challenge notions of uh, ethics and undermine uh, privacy potentially. Three, national security risks, be it uh, cyber security or um, lethal autonomous weapons. Number four, the growing power and influence of big tech and multinationals. Yeah, these companies are playing an increasingly important and influential role in shaping uh, global dynamics. Now, the, the issue is that the institutions that we have today remain ill-equipped to manage this transformation and it and its effects. And third, a transformation of information. The point to stress here is that there's been a proliferation of information, not only in terms of its sources, for example, the rise of the alternative media, but also of the content of information itself, what passes as information. Again, example, the rise of the alternative media. Yeah. Um, with the digital revolution, information is no longer the preserve of those uh, in power. Already, we have seen the creation and proliferation of uh, fake news and the misuse of, of data for various ends. Uh, look at what uh, happened, what was happening in the lead up to the Brexit vote, for example. Um, these have emerged as issues of concern for how they misinform and disinform in ways that can erode trust. Among peoples, among peoples, between peoples, among peoples and governments, and between governments as well. And this gives rise uh, to conflict. This undermines uh, the spirit of cooperation. And again, thus far, the international community continues to struggle to create some kind of uh, a framework for regulating the use of data, especially across borders. Now, um, because we should not view multilateralism through rose tinted glasses. We should, of course, consider the barriers to uh, multilateral cooperation. I alluded to a few already uh, just now, but let me just quickly outline uh, three main ones. The first is multilateral institutions exist to further the interests of states and not uh, vice versa. Yeah? Uh, and indeed, all too often, we've seen multilateral initiatives being hamstrung by states who have obstruct and impede uh, the process. Number two, there's often a gap between rhetoric and reality, uh, rhetoric and uh, well, rhetoric and practice. Yeah, um, the harsh reality is that while there will always be a chorus singing the importance of greater multilateral cooperation, when the rubber hits the road, the picture becomes uh, a bit different. Yeah, uh, one example, unfortunately, is this notion of the responsibility to protect our two P. When it was introduced into the lexicon of the UN, uh, after your, you will recall the string of uh, genocides in the 1990s, right? Rwanda, Srebrenica, Kosovo, etc. It was celebrated and embraced by the international community. But note its silence in the face of the violence uh, in Libya and later in Syria. Yeah, no traction. Second example, I think, uh, again alluded to earlier, was uh, is the, the immediate response of states to the COVID-19 pandemic. After SARS, after Ebola, numerous multilateral agreements were signed and contained references to the need for greater cooperation between states to prepare for future pandemic outbreaks. But when COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic struck, what was the immediate reaction of states? Shut their borders, yeah? Yes, this initial period, uh, or rather after this initial period, numerous agreements uh, have uh, materialized, uh, so that's good. Um, but the point remains that the international community failed to come together in the critical first couple of weeks of the outbreak. And that failure has unfortunately come at a hefty price for humanity. Yeah. Um, so let me move uh, very quickly to the, the so what for Singapore question. In terms of a reset for Singapore, what are our options with regards to multilateralism as a small state caught up in these massive global transformations? Um, 
I think our 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 chairman, our moderator already uh, mentioned how important multilateralism has been for Singapore, uh, Singapore's foreign policy, and indeed Singapore's existence to some extent. Um, let me suggest three uh, specific areas that we should pay attention to, and I'll end on that note. Um, first is um, we have to continue our efforts to reinforce the importance of international law and international organizations in our foreign policy. Uh, though, though these are not perfect instruments, they are far from perfect instruments, international law and international organizations remain important uh, as levelers, uh, especially for small states, and we are a small state. Second, Singapore must stress the importance of an open economy and open trading system. Even before independence, our lifeline had been, uh, inter has been uh, international trade. We must continue to be plugged into these global networks in order to allow you know, our companies, our SMEs, uh, which are the engines of the economy and employment uh, today and tomorrow, uh, to expand into newer markets and to diversify their, their revenue sources. Uh, third, because of limited resources, Singapore must build and nourish strategic partnerships in areas of national priority or where we have competitive advantages to bring to the table. In line, to, with, the, in line with that, we also need to actively go out and uh, seek and forge these partnerships. Um, we've been doing this already and uh, doing this uh, quite uh, actively. Uh, initiatives such as the Forum of Small States, the Global Governance Group, uh, TEPSEC, uh, as you recall, um, the, the precursor to the, the TPP, right? And uh, more recently, our Singapore's involvement uh, in COVAX is also uh, very notable. So this, this uh, uh, steady drumbeat has to continue, if not uh, accelerate, uh, especially in an age where, where there's a lot of uh, pushback on uh, multilateralism, on global uh, cooperation, yeah? So let me, let me conclude uh, by, by saying that uh, multilateralism is uh, is not perfect. Um, it has its problems. It has its uh, challenges, and we have to we have to recognize that we must guard against unrealistic expectations. Um, and also, aspects of the multilateral system are in need of uh, repair. For example, the distribution of power and uh, influence uh, in accordance to the larger shifts. But it is still very important uh, for global cooperation, um, especially for small states like Singapore. Okay, Eugene, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Professor Liao. Uh, I, I think you've given us a, a very rich um, account of uh, multilateralism and global cooperation and how, you know, in your view, uh, there's been a global uh, net plus, right? Uh, and, and, and I think you made a very uh, uh, pertinent point um, you know, of, of how we should go about, you know, trying to build back stronger when, when, we, when we talk about multilateralism, uh, how can we use, you know, the, 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 the current episodes and not just COVID, right, you know, but in many other areas, you know, how can we ensure, you know, that global cooperation uh, is nursed uh, back to health. And, and I think your point about, uh, you know, Singapore not just continuing with what it has done in terms uh, of, of um, being a strong supporter and, and practitioner and promoter of multilateralism and, and global cooperation, that perhaps we should take a, a, a more active role. Um, and I think that's where, you know, we will have, uh, you know, a fair amount of discussion uh, later on. Um, and so now I want to turn the floor to our two uh, discussants, you know, who have been waiting uh, patiently, you know, they have uh, heard uh, the, the, the insights, the inputs of uh, Professor Diamond and, and, and Professor Liao, uh, and I, I want to invite uh, first, uh, you know, Professor Fisher, you know, for your thoughts and, and any other insights that you may have, uh, you know, on, on these two very rich uh, presentations. Uh, Professor Fisher, uh, thanks, Eugene, and and thanks to all, uh, so Jin, Christopher, for the for the invitation. I I don't mind confessing that uh, you're taking me way outside of my comfort zone as a as a medical practitioner, um, but that's a good thing. Um, Joseph mentioned uh, honour and daunting, uh, and and I feel a, a lot the same way 
uh, as scientists, we, we speak in terms of data and uh, in, in many ways hide behind that. We rarely go out on a limb with personal views. So, uh, but, but I do like um, forums like this because they, they, they make me reflect. Um, this, this conference has got a, got a uh, or the conference series has got uh, the word reset attached to it. Uh, I like that, but, uh, but I do question if it's possible. Uh, in, in our, I've been to many outbreaks, obviously, and, and whether they're small, just like in, in a hospital or, or, or locally, um, you always hope that things are, are better afterwards. Uh, in, certainly in Liberia during the Ebola outbreak, we were really ambitious that in the wake of the Ebola outbreak, we would see uh, hospital standards improve, infection control levels rise. Um, but, but unfortunately, just, just so often, uh, you end up going back to, to, to the way it was afterwards. Um, but nothing has been like COVID, so, so I do remain somewhat uh, optimistic. Um, COVID has exposed a lot of what we do badly on the planet, um, and nothing's done that before. Uh, we're, we're all very aware of um, uh, animals roaming free and, and birds just singing and sounding louder. Um, we've seen pollution fall, and uh, and we sort of understand what uh, how global warming is happening, and uh, and really what the planet would look like if if humans weren't on it. Um, if we go back to to the middle of last year, so the other thing is every, every country has had weaknesses exposed, and and many of us call COVID the great revealer. It's it's shown that overcrowded accommodations such as dormitories, uh, homeless shelters, prisons. All, all these places are, are exposed as high transmission um, points because, uh, as a, a colleague of mine once said, uh, if you can't find your weak spot, COVID will find it for you. Uh, we've seen nursing homes rip through where, where really just the, the standards were, were way low. We've seen um, uh, the management of, of miners and, and workers in food processing plants. Um, all of these sites have be, have have been revealed as, as, uh, as I guess, um, poor workplaces. Um, and we know poorer health outcomes are, are obvious in this outbreak in the less privileged, but uh, we, we, we know that's normally the case, but, but COVID has uh, really sent unforgiving reminders that, uh, that lower socioeconomic groups and, and, and poorer, uh, whether at home or work, when you, when you can't uh, distance, you can't work from home, you have to take public transport, you have lots of comorbidities. These are the people that are more likely to get it and also more likely to have an adverse outcome. So, so this is the, the, the remit or the circumstance of, of lower socioeconomic groups. So it's, we knew it already, but it, it's been exposed even more. Uh, it was good to hear from Joseph about corporate multilateralism and the value of international law and these are things, uh, considerations that I'm not really privy to, but, um, but, but uh, I must say at a, at a governmental level, um, I, I've been broadly disappointed. We've seen poor leadership, poor coordination, and an inability of governments to cohesively um, work together um, and, and also work with its people in, in many circumstances. Uh, Prof Diamond mentioned preparedness, and, and, and I couldn't agree more. Um, we, in, in the outbreak response world, um, feel that preparedness is, is obviously fundamental, but we, we also consider readiness, uh, which we kind of loosely defined as the months leading up to an, an inevitable outbreak, which in COVID terms was really January, February for, for the Western world, and, and even then, uh, that most countries weren't getting ready. They weren't getting their tests ready. They, they were still debating strategies. Um, in fact, some countries are still debating their, their strategies. So um, uh, they had no public health laws. They weren't sure how to isolate people. Um, uh, so it's not really surprising after several lockdowns that the people uh, are starting to question or, and lose, lose trust or, or faith in the government's abilities to, to, to do this right. Um, 
So and even taking it another step, step, speaking broadly, not only did, did countries not work with other countries, but, but many blamed each other, uh, as we know. And uh, even countries, uh, even uh, state leaders within some countries started to turn on each other, blame the other state, shut the borders, criticise their contact tracing efforts. And of course, this, this really helps no one um, uh, in, in this type of environment. Uh, now we're seeing uh, self-interest epitomised with countries buying vaccine, some even in excess of their own needs, um, and, and certainly before less, well, less wealthy countries have, have even had a dose. Um, and I'm particularly concerned about the potential impediments to the investigations of the origins of the virus through, through preemptive blame. Um, and this really helps no one except possibly short-term political gain. So, so I do understand the, the perverse incentive, if you like, for local short-term benefit, but, but I just wonder in, this, in, a, in a world where populist democracies um, are becoming more commonplace, um, wh whether this can evolve in the wake of COVID into a, a broader sense of what's right globally um, through, a, I guess, a broad-based sense of one world. Um, I, I, and I guess that's my view of of uh, multilateralism, but but uh, it's if you look at it as a bi as a binary choice, multilateralism versus protectionism, uh, I think inevitably you, you find these types of binary arguments end up somewhere in the middle. Uh, and I'd be delighted if COVID nineteen sees the world mature. Uh, I, as as I say, I've been involved in many outbreaks, and invariably I haven't seen sustained change after sustained change after resolution of the outbreak. Uh, normal life comes back. Um, uh, so Joseph also mentioned information man management, and, and I'd argue that this is, uh, you could talk about information control or however you look at it, but uh, I'd argue that this is a really a root cause of preventing global cooperation. It's um, uh, whether you're dealing with cons conspiracy theorists or just populists, but but really, they can't be allowed to, to recruit people just because their, their ideas are simply a more interesting message than the truth. So, so I think this is where the community buy-in is a problem. And uh, community buy-in is, is, is key to enabling our leaders to, to doing what is right and, and following a, a sort of a, a new era, you know, creating a new era of, of global cooperation. Uh, in outbreak response, we call this risk communications community engagement. We know that without, um, uh, without engaging communities, you cannot control an Ebola outbreak if, if people aren't coming along with you. The, the, the community needs, needs to be critical. Um, so, so if the outbreak uh, responders and science and leadership are not in sync with the community, then, then you're always going to struggle to, to cause to, to resolve an outbreak. Um, Furthermore, if, if, and one of the reasons is if populations don't even believe there's a problem, how can the leaders perform according to what's best uh, for everyone? So, so if people don't believe in COVID or they don't believe in global warming or they don't believe in pollution or, or, or the um, uh, health disparities from, from socioeconomic differences, then, then how are leaders supposed to act? Um, I've heard people speak of individual rights versus community responsibilities, and 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 this is clearly a strength of of Asian countries. But but I just wonder if that can be extrapolated to to higher levels with national needs, comparing that with global responsibilities. Uh, I, I think that's a, a reasonable extension. And and if people uh, can't see community responsibility over individual rights, how can politicians? enact global responsibilities over national needs. Um, let, let me just, so, so I don't want to be negative. Uh, I want to throw a few positives in before I, I finish. Um, the ACT Accelerator, I think, has been a, a, a wonderful effort. Um, for those that don't know, this is the WHO. Um, three, uh, ACT is, the, is called Access to COVID Tools. And the three arms of this are tests, therapeutics, and vaccines, and vaccine is the COVAX facility. So this is championed by, by two major organizations, Gavi and CEPI, uh, in, in collaboration with WHO. 
Um, it's really an unprecedented global effort to ensure that um, vaccines are, are safe and effective and each country in the world has equitable access. Uh, the aim was a billion doses by, by the end of this year, which is 20% of the world. Um, and uh, they've certainly got those um, uh, commercial agreements to buy them. Uh, they're well short on money, but uh, there's, there's good interest. There's 190 member states, so almost everyone has, uh, has joined in, and there are 92 of those countries are eligible for donor funding. So, so even if countries have gone unilaterally or bilaterally to get their, to get their own vaccine, most of those have also signed up to contribute to COVAX and this, what is a, a fair effort. Um, it needs $5 billion this year. It is, there's still a significant shortfall, but at the, and they've got 10 candidate vaccines in their portfolio that they're watching. So, so, um, so, that, so that's a, a, an excellent effort. Um, I could talk about uh, uh, gene sequencing. The information has been outstanding. Publications, medical publications have been fast tracked. So, so they, these are other scientific um, global efforts. Um, uh, so I guess in, in conclusion, I would say I'm quite pleased with multi, multilateralism and global cooperation at a, at a science level. Um, fairly disappointed, not ex unexpectedly, in, in a sort of a geopolitical framework. Um, but uh, as I've said many times, that uh, the Origins mission requires freedom to share information in a, in a no-blame environment. Uh, so at the moment, this means let the science do their work and keep politicians away um, until their performance in multilateralism improves. Sorry, I've gone a little over time, Eugene. No, thank you, Professor Fisher. I, I, I think there are, uh, you know, in your remarks, um, you know, the sort of comp challenges, uh, you know, that face as the world seeks, uh, you know, to reset, um, you know, the, the revelations, uh, you know, the, the fact that COVID is, is a great leveler and, 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 a, and a big question is, you know, how do we move towards, you know, that, that one world, you know, that, that, that you speak of. And, and, and of course that you also raise that local dimension. So thank you. Um, last but not least, uh, you know, I want to invite uh, Ambassador Tan, uh, you know, to share with us her thoughts, uh, you know, on, 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 the very, on, on the variety of topics that have been raised. Um, Ambassador? Um, thank you very much, Eugene. And I must confess that I feel a bit um, underqualified because I think on this panel, everyone is a professor except for me. <laughs> but anyway, I'll try my best. Um, and I think I will share from my perspective as someone who had been spending quite a bit of my career in international organizations, working with uh, various partners um, on various kinds of negotiations. So I think first off, the need for global cooperation will only increase. And it really does not help if instead of finding ways to cooperate, states are being forced to choose sites in the US-China great power competition. Um, some may recall, and uh, Prof Diamond had mentioned it, um, the example of smallpox. And what was remarkable about that was that it happened at the height of the Cold War. And even during that period, the former Soviet Union and the United States were able somehow to find ways to cooperate and together with the World Health Organization and others, succeeded in eradicating smallpox by 1980. And I'm sure all the doctors around me will agree that this was no mean feat by any measure. That this could happen shows that strategic competitors can work together and achieve good outcomes for themselves and the global community if they want and choose to do so. The other observation I would like to share is this. Multilateralism had never been plain sailing and had always contended with nationalism, protectionism, among others. Many international organizations are not as effective as could be wished for. And thanks, Prof Liao, I didn't realize that we have really ballooned by so many times, the number of international organizations even though they are not as effective as could be wished for, quite a few of them have important mandates 
that continue to be relevant. And these international organizations would have to be created if they did not already exist. Today's geopolitical climate makes it unlikely, I think, that any attempt to create a major new international organization will succeed. Hence, we try to reform the key ones, the key international organizations, and make them more fit for purpose and better able to address both the unfinished business, the big, bis the big issues, the serious issues that Prof Diamond um, uh, mentioned, climate change, uh, resource, uh, resources, etc., as well as the emerging issues, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, so on, so on and so forth. Singapore also needs to be tuned in to developments at forums that we are not represented and do not have a say, lest they result in adverse outcomes for us. In such situations, small states can make ourselves better heard when we act collectively. Multilateral negotiation is a painstaking and a very time-consuming process. And it is not inevitable that an agreement can always be had. Multilateralism cannot function well if states adopt a purely transactional approach. For a large disparate group of states to make common cause, achieve significant outcomes for the common good, credible and effective leadership is essential. The United States had traditionally played this role. For the near term, I don't see any state or group of states being able to fully reprise this role. As reminded by our moderator, as well as uh, Prof Liao, um, Singapore is a strong supporter of rules-based multilateralism. At the same time, we are pragmatic. So instead of being defeatist and letting things drift, because of multilateral gridlock. For some issues, it is efficacious to adopt a building block approach with the end goal being to achieve multilateral outcomes eventually. We work with like-minded partners to test out ideas. We can be and have been pathfinders of workable solutions which address common needs. And then we seek to get broader engagement and buy-in from others. Prof Lau had given some, um, some very good examples just now. Um, and I would just add on to say that some of the more current ones will include some of the COVID-19 related ones. Uh, for example, um, Prof Fisher mentioned COVAX. Well, Singapore is a founder as well as a co-chair of the Friends of COVAX uh, to try to get more buy-in and to help the program to work um, better to suit its needs, uh, to, to meet its uh, purposes. And also in the area of digitalization, I would say, we have been doing quite a bit there at both the bilateral, regional, and the multilateral um, uh, forums. Um, regardless of the state of global cooperation, others will partner Singapore more readily if we are successful, credible, reliable, and can bring something to the table. We also need to be alert to emerging trends and be nimble to seize opportunities, distinguish ourselves and steer the cause ahead. It applies to states large and small that foreign policy begins at home. Hence, if domestic politics becomes polarized, foreign policy will likely be dysfunctional. I think I've already like eaten up my five minutes, so I think I will stop there now, thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I, I, I welcome the, uh, your sharing on, on Singapore's approach um, and, and also you know, the, the, the reminder you know, that, that while the system is not perfect, uh, the multilateral system uh, you know, continues to, to deliver uh, you know, on, uh, important benefits um, you know, to, to the world at large. I think the question really is, you know, as we reset, you know, how do we go about ensuring um, you know, that we don't fall back and instead, uh, you know, build back uh, stronger, you know, as, as the common phrase goes. Um, so I now want to, uh, you know, turn to, to, to the question, question and answer session. Uh, there have been quite a number of uh, questions and I encourage the audience to continue to 
uh, post your questions, uh, you know, your, your reactions. Um, and, and I invite the panel, you know, to, uh, you know, to keep your, your, your response short so that we can uh, perhaps cover as much ground um, as possible. Um, when you look at the, let, let me just, uh, you know, pull out some, some of the, uh, the questions. I, we have, we have, uh, there's been discussion by uh, Prof Fisher as well as Ambassador Tan on, on, on vaccine uh, and nationalism. Um, and uh, a question by uh, Shazli, um, as well as, um, you know, the, a question by uh, Prof uh, Hua Kai Hong, um, you know, on the need for uh, regional uh, cooperation. I suppose, you know, if I could combine these two questions together, uh, you know, perhaps not dwelling on vaccine nationalism, uh, I suppose the, 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 the overarching question is, um, what is it that will take, uh, you know, nation states, uh, businesses, uh, people, you know, to come together um, and deal with the crisis that, that the world is facing? Uh, Professor uh, Diamond, perhaps I, you, you could get us uh, going on uh, in, in the Q&A. Uh, I think you will need to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes. What, what will it take for nation states to face up to the fact that we have a crisis? Um, the the black side of me, the cynic of me would say, um, it will take more cases of nation states that thought they had expunged COVID from Windian borders to get reinfected from other nation states. And that will convince them that they will not be safe until their neighbors are also safe. Okay. Any other panelists, a any thoughts on, on what is it that, you know, what do you think would be the trigger, you know, that will get uh, state actors, uh, businesses, and all, you know, to, to look beyond, uh, you know, their belly buttons, if I could put it that way, and, and to focus on the common good. Um, Maybe if I can uh, just share some quick thoughts on this. I think um, I would say um, there, are, there are at least three things. The first is um, we have to bear in mind uh, this issue of public interest in cooperation uh, beyond the, the boundaries, the borders of the, of the nation state. We have to understand that uh, political leaders, um, the, they are responsible and obligated to those who have empowered them to advance and defend the national interest. That's the reality, right? So the sovereignty. Um, so people, the public has to realize that um, their interests are quite intimately, increasingly intim intimately intertwined with the interests of, of others. And again, um, uh, to add on to what Professor Diamond said, uh, this issue of uh, COVID and the very myopic approach of uh, vaccine nationalism is a case in point. You can, you can inoculate your entire country, but unless you intend to close off that country from the rest of the world and international trade, it still doesn't quite uh, get the job done, right? Uh, others have to be uh, inoculated as well. The second issue is trust. There's too little trust uh, within communities, um, we talked about uh, corporations and data. There's little trust in data. There's little trust between companies and between countries. Yeah. So this element of a trust deficit is hampering a lot of the efforts uh, or a lot of the, the potential for, for cooperation. And third and lastly is this issue of politicization. We have too many people, too many leaders trying to take advantage of the situation by politicizing it and stirring up the uh, uh, you know, public opinion. And that circles it back to my first point. Yeah, so it really is a vicious cycle, unfortunately. So, Professor Fisher? Yeah, the, um, the, the rationale is correct that we're not all safe until everybody's safe. However, um, vaccine nationalism actually makes sense, um, ironically, first. And we're being saved from global embarrassment because actually the countries that we expected to be doing the best in this outbreak in terms of controlling disease are actually doing the worst. So you could argue if, if these countries were doing very well, 
um, you could say, why aren't you giving it to the countries that are struggling? But actually, Asia and Africa is doing much better than, than um, US, Canada, um, Western Europe, uh, Eastern Europe even, uh, and the Middle East. So, so I can understand why they would say, actually, we want to vaccinate ourselves first. I, I think that multilateralism will happen, but uh, I, I don't think you're going to see it happen before they get some sort of control within their borders. Uh, and, and in some ways, uh, as I say, I think we're being uh, saved from that embarrassment of, uh, of wealthy countries with no disease vaccinating themselves in favour of poorer countries with lots of disease. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Prof. Fisher, you know, for that contrarian uh, view, uh, you know, of how perhaps, you know, the, the countries are not doing so well, uh, you know, in the terms of that they are seeking to vaccinate themselves, you know, might actually do, uh, you know, the world a whole good, a, a whole lot of good. Uh, Ambassador Sam, would you have any thoughts, um, you know, on, on this issue of, um, you know, what might be a trigger, what could help? Uh, you know, people to come together, you know, and, and revive, you know, that, that, that multilateral approach, you know, to many of these issues that, that, that afflict man, uh, humankind. I think, unfortunately, humans being humans, we need to be really directly affected in a very serious way before, before things hit home, you know. And here, I, 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 I think what Prof Fisher said, you know, about, e about his personal experience about Ebola, you know, you go in, you thought it's something that's very serious and you thought maybe after that something will really happen, but then sometimes flies, things stabilise and well, things go back to what they used to be and not, things seem to be having better. So I think, I think even with some big direct hit tragedies, that may not do the trick on its own. Um, I think leadership, leadership is extremely important and leadership cannot be exercised in the absence of trust. Um, and we, we, are, we are a global village and we have with modern technology, modern communications, um, a lot of information. But with more information available, I don't know, I think perhaps this is another transition phase like Prof Liao said, you know, we don't quite know how to handle this. So in a way, it has also created this backlash against um, professionals, against experts. And, um, and with all this going on, how are we going to be able to mobilize people in one direction? I think that is something that we all really need to put on our collective thinking has. And it doesn't help, of course, if, if it, is being polar, it is being politicized, you know, for each narrow political party gains. So I don't know. So I think, I think the job for people is to do what we can. So amongst the experts, amongst the specialists, amongst the practitioners, I think we need to do what we can to try to get the world collectively um, to, to find common purpose and common interests and then try to, try to move things ahead. Um, I talked about leadership. Um, of course, we would prefer it if we have um, someone who's eminently qualified. I mean, if you're talking about states, some big states who have the resources, uh, both in terms of finance, in terms of intellectual capital, et cetera, to lead the way. But we each of us actually do have um, agency, you know? So it's, it's like what I said, you know, you don't, you don't just give up, ah, yeah, I'm so small, Singapore is so small, what can we do? No, you do what you can, you know? And, and, and you, you try to influence people next to you, uh, if you can, or you work with like-minded partners further afield and you come up with something workable and hopefully we can be the multiplier. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Ambassador, Ambassador Tan. I think it's a, it's a constant reminder how uh, multilateralism begins at home right? and, and, and how important it is for you know, uh, supporters of multilateralism to ensure you know, that their domestic audiences are, are, are pretty much geared towards um, you know, supporting you know, the effort uh, you know, to be multilateralist. Uh, Professor Diamond, this is a question you know, very much uh, directed at you. Uh, you know, it is the most popular question at this point in time, uh, uh, posed by Gillian and, and, and many others. I, I just want to read it to you uh, based on it, the example that you gave in your remarks. Um, how does Finland sustain and justify the resources expended to anticipate every threat? Um, over the years, you know, how is that political will and social instinct maintain within the state and among citizens? Uh, Professor Diamond? Good question. Uh, Finland, country that fascinates me. When one hears about 
the efforts of Finland to be prepared for everything, to be prepared for food shortages, electricity breakdowns, diseases, da, 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 da. A first reaction of many people is, oh, that's so expensive. Um, how could we afford it? It turns out that it's surprisingly cheap to be prepared for everything. And we've discovered that it's very, expen very expensive to be unprepared. In the case of Finland, Finland has supported its stockpiling of everything by a small tax on petrol, on gasoline. The tax is trivial. It's, it's a fraction of a few cents per liter of petrol. Um, the cost is very, very slight. Um, to be, however, without petrol or to be without face masks when the need strikes, in the United States, we discovered in February, because we did not have supplies not only of face masks, but we also did not have stockpiles of toilet paper and of other necessities, the cost of face masks shot up to $8 and toilet paper ran out in the supermarkets. So we discovered it's very expensive to be unprepared and it's cheap to be prepared. I, I suppose, you know, the, uh, Professor Diamond, that there is that need for you know, that domestic commitment, right? And, and I suppose Finland is one country, you know, that has been able to, perhaps because of the history, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that they were colonized by Russia, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, Russia previously, and, um, you know, that may have compelled them, you know, to, 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 to prepare, uh, you know, for, for every eventuality. And I suppose given that their, their relative wealth, um, you know, they are able to perhaps uh, better anticipate and prepare, you know, than, than many other, uh, uh, countries. That's a very interesting point that you raise, and it's one of great, um, great general interest. Why is it that some countries have dealt better than other countries? Why have some countries pursued individualism to a destructive degree, notably my own country, and why have other countries been much more cooperative? Um, that lies partly in culture and in history. There are cultures that are much more individualistic than others, um, cultures that are much more cooperative. Asian countries, um, for example, are in general, East Asian countries foster cooperation more than European countries and especially the United States. That's understandable from our, from our history. And recently um, there's been a, a interesting explanation for the difference in co internal cooperation uh, within East Asian countries and European countries. East Asian agriculture depends upon rice. European agriculture depends upon wheat. Rice agriculture, irrigated rice agriculture requires cooperation. A rice farmer cannot turn on the irrigation water without considering what the neighbors are doing. Whereas wheat farming is done one by one. A wheat farmer sows regardless of what the neighbors are doing. And so individualism has been historical in Europe for thousands of years with its wheat agriculture. Cooperation has been present in, demanded in Asia for thousands of years, depending upon rice agriculture. But the end result of this, as we've seen, is that the response to COVID has been outstanding in countries like Vietnam and Korea and China, and it's been miserable in the United States and some European countries. Thank you. Um, this is a very interesting take, you know, so the next time when, when I have rice, you know, I'll try and remember that maybe th th that makes me a bit more communitarian. Um, I, I now want to, to direct this question to, to Professor Liao and, 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 uh, and Ambassador Tan. Uh, you know, this is a question, uh, you know, that Matthew Ting and, and several others posed, uh, you know, which is, uh, you know, the UN and multilateralism or multilateral organizations, you know, they were born from a major crisis, the Second World War. Uh, and so the, the, the question is, you know, why has multilateralism declined, uh, you know, particularly during this uh, global crisis, right? And, and, and what has changed, you know, in global society? Uh, Professor Liao? Okay, um, yes, we saw, uh, as, I, as I mentioned in my presentation, we saw a, a very clear and definitive uh, increase uptick in multilateralism. Um, and uh, I agree with uh, Ambassador Tan's uh, comment earlier that if we wanted to um, create a, a multilateral uh, organization today, it will be much more difficult than, than, uh, than years ago, right? Um, one reason possibly because we have so many, you know, um, you, you could be reinventing the wheel, but more importantly is the climate uh, towards uh, multilateralism which is essentially 
uh, what, I'm, what I'm talking about is essentially the climate towards uh, globalization today as well. Yeah, um, we have seen even before uh, COVID, right? Um, for a number of years already, we've seen in uh, many societies, especially um, in, in in Europe, in North America, this pushback against uh, globalization. Yeah, um, and that affects the the. I mean, in terms of public opinions view on the commitment that the state, the government should be making to um, other countries in terms of um, multilateral uh, cooperation that has been a victim of um, this uh, up upsurge of uh, more sort of a, um, a narrow nationalistic uh, sentiments yeah, played up by populist uh, uh, political leaders as well. So, so we are looking at a very um, a very potent combination of populism and nationalism um, that we have to grapple with. I think uh, the, the United States has been, uh, has been struggling with this. Um, I don't think that uh, things are going to change overnight uh, anyway, uh, tomorrow or the day after, depending on, on where you are. Um, a new administration is going to be uh, seriously uh, preoccupied, not just preoccupied, but really the, the, the priority of uh, a new uh, administration in the US will have to be to, to resolve these issues uh, within their countries. And within their, their boundaries. And it's not just the United States. In many countries, uh, governments are struggling uh, with this, dealing with populations that are, are increasingly uh, suspicious of um, globalization, of uh, multilateralism. And uh, it gets back to the issue I mentioned earlier of uh, trust, a lack of trust in, in these uh, institutions uh, in, in the public mind. And that, that has to be dealt with, I think, it has to be dealt with uh, with uh, a, a very healthy and extensive dose of public education um, that uh, this is not, uh, you know, globalization and multilateral cooperation does not necessarily mean that uh, the interest of the individual, his or her community or the country for that matter is seriously uh, undermined. Yeah. Um, but it's going to be a, a, a very long and tedious effort. Ambassador, would you like to jump in? Yes, I, I think um, Prof Lau had said a lot of things that I, I completely agree with. And I think a lot of the problems we're having now in terms of multilateral cooperation is actually a reflection of um, in serious inadequacies domestically um, in many countries around the world. But there are no easy solutions. Um, so I think therein is the biggest challenge. And there's something else I thought maybe I will also share um, in, in, in terms of the informal rules of, of operation in some of the international organizations. Each international organization is, of course, unique. But in certain organizations, for example, where there is a huge emphasis on consensus, people have always asked, is this consensus principle something that is really helping to forge consensus or something that is actually preventing cooperation. Um, again, no straight answers, but I do want to observe that in the World Trade Organization, which I have spent quite a number of my years working um, in negotiations, etc. cetera. Um, in recent years, it has been very difficult to, to really get anything moving because of this consensus principle. And instead of using it as something to, to bring people together, every country now, uh, even the, um, even for the smallest um, domestic concerns, they can just come up and say that, you know, um, I'm sorry, I block consensus because um, I'm not willing to go along. So I, I think, I think this, this spirit of cooperation, we need to re, re infuse that amongst countries. But before you can successfully do that, I think we really need to address domestic politics so that the leadership can very well come out and talk to other states to say that, hey, you know, I have my people behind me and um, this is how we want and how, this is how we encourage uh, the world to move the direction that we want to go into. Okay. As the clock runs down, I, I'm now going to uh, put together, you know, three sort of sets of questions um, and, and, and we now sort of uh, travel back to Singapore. 
Um, I think these are questions that relate to Singapore. And, and so, you know, um, this by JT, Claire, uh, and an and anonymous uh, uh, member of the audience. Um, and I invite the panel, you know, to, to pick and choose uh, which one is it that they would like, um, you, you know, to pick. Um, and, you know, I know Professor Diamond, uh, um, you know, is, is not based in Singapore, um, but I would appreciate your views, you know, as someone who, who looks at Singapore from, from afar. Um, so th these are, these are some, some of the questions, right? Um, uh, first is, you know, how can we, uh, we meaning Singapore, you know, prepare our, our students, our young, you know, to be more empathetic, uh, respectful and understanding of, uh, you know, the needs of our Southeast Asia counterpart. Uh, you know, and, and this is particularly in a situation where, you know, very often, you know, the, we, we sort of tell ourselves that we are better, richer and more advanced, uh, you know, than, than our neighbours. Uh, so the question of, you know, how, how can we in Singapore, you know, continue to ensure that our young, uh, the, the citizenry, you know, will continue to be strong supporters of uh, multilateralism and global cooperation. Um, the other set of questions, you know, relate to, uh, you know, how Singapore can better tap, uh, you know, the influence of uh, non-state actors, you know, such as uh, international organizations, particularly those that are homegrown, uh, you know, to, to build on, you know, traditional diplomacy uh, and, and I suppose towards the, the goal of multilateralism uh, and global cooperation. Um, Professor Leo, maybe you could, you, could, you could kick us off, you know, pick and choose whichever that, that, that you... you Okay, so um, just very quickly, my reaction to the first question is um, I'm an educator, so education obviously will be very important. I tell you, I personally, I lament the amount of attention that we, that we are giving to Southeast Asia in terms of educating our young. Yeah? They are all looking beyond our, our immediate neighbourhood. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, yeah. You know, uh, uh, being interested in in uh, what's happening in North America, in Europe, etc. There's nothing wrong with that, but we shouldn't lose sight of our immediate uh, neighborhood. So, one concrete example. Another thing I lament is that um, we have taken away the requirement to to study Malay. Yeah, I think um, I think the, the the time has come for us to really uh, consider whether. Uh, we should reintroduce some degree of uh, Malay language education. Uh, it's 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 the language, the lingua franca of uh, of our immediate region, isn't it? Right. Um, but uh, that's something that we need to address. As far as multilateral uh, institutions, um, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, Singapore is really very actively involved. Uh, by necessity, but also um, uh, because of uh, its importance to our our larger foreign policy. Basically, Singapore needs to double down uh, on it. Yeah, Singapore needs to double down on it. On it. Um, in the absence of leadership, it should not be a case where we we just uh, go along with, uh, with the flow. Working with other partners, um, it is a very different. Uh, geopolitical environment anyway, working with other partners, like-minded partners, we can seed ideas, okay, uh, which hopefully can be, can be nurtured, cultivated, and grow into uh, more, more major institutions. And it's not about just building new organizations, even this issue of reforming existing organizations. Many of them, goodness knows, many of them need to be reformed. Yeah. Professor Diamond? Would you like to jump in? Yes, I have succeeded in unmuting. Um, uh, as someone living distant from Singapore, but who's visited there um, frequently, um, you say yourselves, Singapore is a small country. I'm struck by Singapore being a, a small country. And I have experience of other small countries, Finland, even smaller, Switzerland, Israel, a small country. Um, small countries, uh, there are small countries that are important far beyond their numbers and their population. Um, those are small countries that have invested their limited over resources overseas in a strategic manner. Uh, the Israeli foreign aid program is famously effective. Again, Switzerland and Finland, they're small countries, Finland with a population of 
what, 8 million, a little more than Singapore, Switzerland with population 10 million, now double Singapore. But as measured by effect on the world, Switzerland, Finland, and Israel are big countries. Singapore is also a, a big country. Um, I mentioned before, um, Singapore, although Singapore stands low quantitatively on the Asian ladder, Singapore stands very high qualitatively on the Asian ladder. And so I see uh, Singapore as potentially enjoying the opportunity for playing out a position of leadership within Southeast Asia, just as Switzerland and Finland and Israel play positions of leadership on the globe far out of proportion to their numbers. Professor Fisher? Uh, I'll be very quick. Uh, certainly from the, the student point of view, I think it's all about uh, engagement, uh, whether it's uh, electives, uh, competitions, uh, just just developing relationships, and actually actually understanding what's what's going there. So it's it's largely getting out of Singapore, whether it's virtually or or for a period of time. Um, in terms of, I can speak for the WH. I can speak uh, about our relationship with WHO, which is remarkably strong. Um, I, I, I'm personally the chair of the steering committee of the Global Outbreak Alert Response Network, so that. That's a WHO network of 250 outbreak responders. Uh, there'd, be, there'd be 10 or 12 um, uh, partners within Singapore in that network. Um, uh, it, it is really unusual for me to go to Geneva and not bump into a few people from Singapore uh, in HQ. And these might be people that are doing a six month attachment in the epidemiology section or something like that. So um, when, when the two gentlemen on the on the mission to China got stranded in Singapore. Um, there were relationships were immediately invoked and and we were able to at least get get one moved moved on. So so um, so I, I think uh, I can speak very highly of the relationship between Singapore and WHO. Okay. And and last but not least, uh, Ambassador, would you have any thoughts? Um, a bit irreverent. Sir. Um, in terms of the, um, how to educate our youngsters, I, I think uh, all the serious bits have already been mentioned, but I just want to say that actually within Singapore itself, I, many of our youngsters, they, uh, they have taken some things for granted, even domestically. I mean, I just give a very simple example, like washing up, you know, washing up your cups and, and plates after dinner. You know, not everyone has a washing machine. And uh, in my time, we, we, we just washed our dishes. But nowadays, many kids, you know, they seem to feel that that is someone else's job. Um, if they don't have a maid, then it probably it's a mother's job. <laughs> the mother's not on maybe the father's job. And even, for example, our hawker center, you know, even till today, despite the effort, you know, to get people to return their trays um, after they've eaten, we don't do that. And some people still give the excuse that if I did that, oh, I'm depriving the auntie of, of her job, you know. I think in Singapore, we, we need to do some introspection. I, I think um, that that's one thing, uh, especially at the level of our use, but not just our use, because I noticed some of my middle-aged colleagues uh, also having the same um, characteristic tra traits. Um, so that, that's my irreverent response, lah, huh? in addition to um, the, the ones that have been given by my fellow panelists. Um, on the second point about um, working more with the non-state actors, I think there's certainly scope to do so, but I think we also need to be very uh, aware. So, because we cannot get in a situation where we are just acting without informed information, so it is important to talk to and engage with experts, people who are really um, affected or who have really studied an issue. That's very important. But at the same time, we should not be caught in a situation where we are forever in the state of consulting. Um, and never in the state of action, because ultimately governance is about policy, um, moving in a certain direction, which will hopefully be for the common good. So I think we need to be able to strike a balance that yes, consult, engage more, but at the end of the day, I think we still need to be informed by what we think is the are the appropriate actions to take. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, you know, uh, um, panelists. I, I, I wish we had more time um, but I think in the limited time that we have, uh, you know, we have had a very uh, rich uh, discussion. I think, you know, if I could just quickly summarize, um, you know, I think there is a view that 
uh, multilateralism uh, and global cooperation continue uh, you know, to be important modes by which um, the world uh, can deal with uh, the serious challenges that, that face uh, humankind. Uh, the question now is, you know, how do we ensure these multilateral institutions, uh, you know, thrive? How can we, uh, as we reset, you know, how can we uh, learn, uh, you know, to, to be uh, not just a, an advocate, but also a promoter uh, and a practitioner? I think that's important, not just for Singapore, you know, which has thrived, you know, uh, on the basis of a multilateral uh, rules-based uh, system. Uh, I think the second is, uh, you know, takeaway that, 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 that I have is that uh, multilateralism and global cooperation requires a lot of hard work. Um, and, and I think in, in the many discussions that we have had, uh, it is also about how do we nurture, uh, you know, that domestic uh, support uh, and enthusiasm, right? And, and I suppose this is where the challenge would be for policymakers, you know, to show how the local connects, you know, with uh, the global, right? How, how do we uh, ensure, you know, that people recognize, uh, you know, that no man is an island uh, and how do we make, you know, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, a, a very good uh, learning experience. Um, and so, you know, I, I wish I could go on. I, I think that there are many more thoughts, you know, and there, there, were, there were also many more questions, um, you know, but in the interest of time, you know, we don't have, but I think IPS is a mechanism by which you could continue to uh, put those questions to us. Uh, and before I close, you know, I just would like to invite the audience, you know, in your own way, you know, to, to thank, uh, you know, Professor Jared Diamond, Professor Joseph Liao, uh, Professor Dale Fisher, uh, and Ambassador Tan, you know, for their sharing, for their insights, uh, and for the many thought-provoking ideas that they have uh, um, shared with us, right? And, and with that, you know, I thank you for being a very uh, engaged audience, right? And, and I would like to turn you back to IPS, uh, So Chin. Hi. Thank you, Eugene, for moderating today's session. And thank you to our panelists, Professor Jared Diamond and Dr. Joseph Liao, our discussants, Professor Dale Fisher and Ambassador Tan Yuan, for your insights. Thank you, too, to our audience for your participation. The session has been recorded, and you'll be able to review it at any time on this conference page. Please also continue with your comments in the conference chat. They'll be taken on board for the plenary session on January 25th, as well as for the IPS Reimagining Singapore 2030 project. We will now take a break. I'd like to invite you to come back at 4 p.m. for another panel discussion on politics and governance called The Values and Qualities of Leadership. It will be moderated by IPS Deputy Director for Research, Dr. Gillian Cole, and her guests will be Ambassador Chan Heng Chi, Professor Margaret Heffernan from the University of Bath, Mr. Han Fook Kwang from the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, and Madam Zuraida Abdullah from Yayasan Mendaki. Thank you and see you at 4 p.m.